Okay, today we are going to be reading from Joshua 7. And we see an interesting incident where God tells Joshua to get up off his face and stop praying. Doesn't sound like something we'd often hear from the Lord, but we will see why here in this passage. It says uh, in Joshua 7 verse 10, The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up, what are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things and have stolen it. They have lied, they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites can, cannot stand up against their enemies. They turn their backs and they run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy what is, whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Okay, so we have this one guy named Achan, this one troublemaker who after they defeat the city of Jericho, I believe it was Jericho, and they take the city and they destroy it, he sneaks some of the goods and he hides them in his tent. He gets a little greedy. He decides, oh, I'm going to take some of this stuff for myself. I, We'll see what he did. Uh, we'll see. Achan replied, it is true I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. I saw the plunder a beautiful robe in, from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, a bar of gold, weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them, and they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So, we see this one man's greed brought trouble on the whole entire community. We can also uh, uh, see in Proverbs where it says the greedy bring trouble on their households, uh, but the one who rejects a bribe will live. We see how greed can cause a lot of different problems, even in the family. The whole family of Achan suffered for his sin, and the whole community suffered for his sin. Just think about it this way. Let's suppose, you know, our sins don't just affect us. Very often they affect everyone associated to us, and we bring trouble to those around us through our wicked and sinful disobedient lifestyles. When we're in sin, we can't just say, well, just don't bother me, it's my business. Well, you're going to make it into somebody else's problem if you keep doing it. It has a domino effect. That's the way sin works. And so we see that Achan's family was destroyed as a result of that, as well as himself. He destroyed himself. And, you know, the principle here is we see Joshua doesn't know what happened, so he's down praying before the Lord, and he's trying to figure out why when they went to this other city to try to conquer it, they got defeated so sorely. And God's like, well, you know, you guys sinned. You took something that didn't belong to you. I told you to take everything from that city and devote it to destruction. I didn't tell you to covet it and take it as your own. And so we see how undealt with sin can hinder our prayer life. The scripture says the Lord is close to the, is near to the righteous. Uh, the, no, it says the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so when it comes down to our prayer life, if we want to have a good solid prayer life, we're going to deal with whatever the Lord is pointing at in our own lives that's deep within inside of us that he wants us to deal with. And that is the step. That is the step to good, wholesome fellowship with the Lord that's unhindered. When we're living in sin or disobedient, when he's saying, I need you to deal with this over there, and we refuse to do it, we're in essence being like Achan and keeping something in our lives that we should devote to destruction. Meaning we should get rid of it, we should destroy it, we should get it out of our lives, whether it's, and I'm not saying like, let's say it's a person, you need it. If there's somebody you're caught up with that you don't need to be involved with, you need to get them out of your life. Not saying you kill them. No, not at all. We're not supposed to kill people. But the, we're supposed to cut ruthlessly out of our lives whatever is causing our downfall. Meaning sometimes we have to decide to walk away from a relationship, a friend, a toxic influence. We have to cut it out of our lives, cut them out of our lives. Or whether it's some kind of sin that we're not not dealing with, we need to deal with that as soon as possible. Whether it's some kind of secret sin, vice, habit, what have you. 
And that is the way we get our prayers answered. If uh, we turn to Isaiah 59, let's turn there real quick, we'll see one of the reasons God doesn't answer prayer. Let's go to Isaiah 59. Takes a little while to get there. Isaiah 59 says, uh, almost there. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, the Lord, okay, let's see. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God, your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so you will not, so he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. So, that was one of the reasons God wasn't responding to the nation when he was like about to bring them into captivity. They, he's like, hey, listen. It's not that I don't hear your prayers, I'm just ignoring them because you won't deal with your sin. And my ears not so dull that I can't hear you. No, it's in fact your sin that's keeping me from acting on your behalf. And that's what we got to be careful with is when we're living in disobedience and we're praying for this or that, we got to really deal with that area of sin in our lives that we need to repent of before we expect God to answer our prayers. Now, also this applies to someone who has not come to know Christ yet who has not repented of their sins, believed the gospel, and turned from their sins to follow Jesus Christ. Until we do that, God won't listen to us either. God saying, I need you to repent of your sins and have faith in Jesus Christ, my son, so that you can be forgiven and, un and your sin is not the barrier that comes between you and me. Jesus Christ came to die for our sins so that our sins no longer would have to be a barrier between us and God. So if we still have yet to do that, if someone still has yet to do that, I encourage you, think about what I'm saying. You know, because God is gracious and merciful and ready to forgive if we come to him in true repentance and faith and turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven and against you. You know, when there's real repentance, we see in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, the father was overjoyed to see his son. His father was rejoicing that his lost son came back home. And that, and Jesus said, For I tell you, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents of his sin than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And what does that mean? Does that mean that God doesn't delight in our obedience? If we're obeying God faithfully, does God not really delight in that? Yo, of course he does. But like, let's say you have one family member that's making bad choices, going the wrong path, destroying their lives, and all of your other children are doing what they're supposed to do and pleasing you in that way, and they're making good choices, they're succeeding in life and making wise and healthy choices. You're happy about that, but as long as that one lost stray child is off doing their own thing you still have kind of anxiety and trouble in your heart because you're like well i want my whole family to be on the right track as long as there's that one person out there doing their doing making those foolish decisions that one child it will cause grief even to a father even if all the rest of his children a father or mother even if all the rest of their children are doing what they're supposed to do making wise choices because it always hurts to have even just one stray prodigal. And so that's that's the invitation of grace for us is that Jesus is ready to welcome the sinner no matter how far they've wandered off if they turn back to him Jesus Christ is willing to forgive and we see in Luke 15 the father of the prodigal son in Jesus's story threw that young man a party and rejoiced and said my son was dead but now he's alive he was lost but now he's found we must celebrate. And that is what that is the good news that means that even though we have all blown it, as it says, for we, like sheep, have all gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. That's in Isaiah. And that's meaning Jesus Christ bore our sins so that we could turn to him and have peace with God. And 
live the life he's called us to live. No longer making foolish, stupid, sinful choices. That gets us into trouble. That really messes up our lives. We may think it's fun for a little while, but as it says in Scripture, the fleeting pleasures of sin. I just encourage you, if you have strayed from the Lord today, I encourage you, turn back to him. You know, he is more than willing to receive you back if you turn to him in true repent repentance and seek him and try to get back on track. God bless you guys.